All right, beautiful and lovely people. Thank you for coming on the show, spending time with me. This is going to be such a good show, educational, but really I do appreciate the time you're taking to listen to this uh, as always. And if you've been doing it since day one, even more so if you've been doing it since last week, all the love to you too. All right, check this out. I'm going to be talking about on this knowledge bomb, something really important, Uh, a piece of our health that if we are not paying attention to or optimizing, then all of our health falls or is not in the highest vibration as it could be. So I really want to talk about this very special nerve in the body and how we optimize it. And also we have a very special guest, a Nobel Prize winner, 1998 Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Lou Ignaro. We're going to talk about nitric oxide. What is it? Where is it found? How do we optimize it if it's so beneficial for us? And really some really good take homes and gems. So I can't wait to get into that. Without further ado, I want to talk to you about this vagus nerve. Let's get into it. Knowledge bomb. All right, I said it, vagus nerve, one of the most important and intriguing nerves in the whole body. And it's V-A-G-U-S, not vagus, like Sin City, okay? But vagus in Latin actually means wanderer, the wandering nerve. And it's called a wandering nerve because it travels from the brain to different parts in the body. It actually wanders all around, and then it ends right in the abdomen. But really, it's intriguing because when it ain't working right, our organs are not working right, all right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this amazing nerve and what disrupts it, what's really, really the cause of a lot of our health issues and really how to optimize it. When your vagus nerve is not firing, your health is not. Your health is not in line. Your health is not in the highest level. Your health is way, being weighed down by something. And your vagus nerve actually can become disrupted by many different things. Amongst all of its functions, really some of the crown jewels of what the vagus nerve does is it modulates digestion and mood, right? So the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. That means it comes straight from the brain, not the spinal cord, right? And it's part of the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. What I mean by that is basically all the functions that have to do with rest and digest this nerve is in control of, right? Uh, The opposite of fight or flight. But with that said, it's not under conscious control. We can't think, let me fire up this vagus nerve and then let me control my digestion. It doesn't work that way. We can optimize it. I'm going to mention a little bit later how to do that. But the vagus nerve is long. The brainstem, it comes from the brainstem actually, through the neck, and it branches off throughout the body, and and the longest nerve goes right into the abdomen. It's the longest cranial nerve we have. And it provides sensation signals to different organs. Without it, basically, you wouldn't have the ability to taste, or it would be diminished, your ability to taste. This is why when you're sick, sometimes you lose the sensation of sense, of smell, or sense of taste. It's because viruses are disrupting these cranial nerves. You always want to pay attention to the sudden onset of the loss of vision, hearing, taste, or smell, because that can be an early sign of a neurological condition or even a tumor. That's a side note for you, okay? But when it comes to the vagus nerve, without it, our speech would be affected. Uh, We wouldn't be able to swallow. Breathing would be diminished. Our heart rhythm would be off. It's a big part of it. And, And we wouldn't be able to digest food. Now, about 10 to 20% of the nerve cells that are coming from the vagus nerve are involved in the movement, the signaling of movement of food through the gut, right? That stimulation of telling, all right, we're eating, let's, let's, let's keep it moving. The rest are involved in sending information about what is happening in the gut to our brain. Without it, we would, have, we would not have the direct communication of the gut brain access. You may have heard of that, the gut-brain access. The gut and the brain are intimately tied, and guess what they're tied by? The vagus nerve. And it has a bi-directional relationship. It goes both ways. So as per the 2018 article in Psychology Magazine, these authors state, the vagus nerve is responsible for monitoring the psychological homeostasis, the balance, and connecting the emotional and cognitive areas of the brain with peripheral intestinal functions, such as immune activation intestinal permeability, right? Leaky gut, enteric reflex, and 
enteroendocrine signaling, basically the release of hormones in the gut. In other words, basically what's happening is the vagus nerve is essentially reading the gut, the environment of the gut, the gut microbiome, and it's initiating a response based on that, whether it needs to activate inflammation or reduce inflammation, as well as stimulating digestion and even controlling our mood. This is why you hear people say depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders start in the gut because the vagus nerve is intimately tied with that expression. The nerve is reacting to signaling molecules from the gut and vice versa. So your gut health is intimately, like I said, tied to the vagus nerve. Your mood health is intimately tied to the vagus nerve. So more on the mood aspect, adults with poor vagal tone, which I'll go into later, have more depression, anger, mental stress, anxiety. A little more from the authors of the 2018 article, the overdrive of the HPA axis is most consistently seen in subjects with more severe depression when the cortisol feedback inhibitory mechanisms are impaired, contributing to cytokine oversecretion, which is oversecretion of these inflammatory molecules. Cytokine oversecretion, cytokine oversecretion, it has been shown that chronic exposure to elevated inflammatory cytokines can lead to depression. This may, might be the explanation by the fact that cytokine overexpression leads to reduction of serotonin levels. Okay, so low, low, low neurotransmitters like serotonin are not necessarily the cause of depression at all. They're not the root cause, at least. Those are downstream effects. What this is saying is that HPA access, the brain, the, the hypothalamic pituitary access, right, to the adrenal, that, that communication of basically the brain saying, oh, we're stressed, adrenal glands, please release cortisol, that is impaired. So that HPA access, the hypothalamic pituitary, the adrenal access, is a pathway where the vagus nerve actually can mediate in anti-inflammatory effects. What that means is basically... When your HPA axis is off, the brain and the adrenal glands, when that stress response is off, then you're going to be releasing more cortisol and more inflammatory molecules in the body, those proteins. The belief now is that those inflammatory molecules are, are the main driver of mood disorders in folks in depression. And a lot of it is starting right in the gut. So basically, the vagus nerve can exert anti-inflammatory properties. It's going to be the thing that turns down the heat. A European multi-center study demonstrated the positive effect of vagal nerve stimulation on depressive symptoms. In patients with treatment-resistant depression, the application of vagal nerve stimulation over a period of three months resulted in a response rate of 37% and a remission of 17% of depression. After one year, the response rate reached 53% and the remission rate of 33%. That's better than a lot of the drugs out there that are being used for depression. Uh, other studies are showing the same thing. A multitude of other studies are showing the same thing, that actually vagal nerve stimulation can be comparable or better than medication for depression, which is interesting. I'm going to tell you more about vagal nerve stimulation. And why? It's because the vagus nerve, the stimulation, the strengthening of the vagus nerve is helping, helping balance those inflammatory cytokines that are driving and causing mood disorders like depression. Now, I said vagal tone before, but I want to make it very clear about what that, it, what that is. Vagal tone is simply the activity of the vagus nerve, increased activity of the vagus nerve. The stronger the vagal tone, the stronger the parasympathetic nervous system that is working. The stronger the vagal tone, the stronger the physical health. As per Dr. Mladen Golubic, MD, the medical director of the Cleveland Clinic, says, the vagal response reduces stress. It reduces our heart rate, our blood pressure, it changes the function of certain parts of our brain, stimulates digestion, and all those things are happening when we're relaxed, right? So again, the stronger the vagus nerve, the tone of that, the more that we are in a relaxed state. But not only that, the stronger the vagal tone, the better recovery, the better rejuvenation, and the better healing. Better the vagal tone, the quicker you're relaxing after acute stress. A 2017 study in the Journal of Internal Medicine showed 
an inverse relationship between vagal tone and blood tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is an inflammatory molecule in the body in patients with Crohn disease who are inflamed in itself as a whole, uh, which is an inflammatory bowel disease where you have inflammation throughout the whole intestine. But what's that mean? It means chronic vagal stimulation has anti-inflammatory properties to the body, and it's helping these folks. And this was seen in rat models in this pi- and, and the pilot study in this group. And granted, this was a small group, but it was telling about how the nerve affects inflammation, which is affecting these folks with inflammatory bowel disease. And in this study for folks with ulcerative colitis, uh, which was improving with increased vagal tone, you might ask, how did they assess vagal tone? How do we know? What's our vagal tone, right? We want to get to that. We want to get to the good stuff. One of the measures of vagal tone that we're using is heart rate variability. Uh, Basically, it is a reliable measure of vagal activity. Because you'll remember that I said that vagal, the vagus nerve is a me- it measures the variation in time between each heartbeat. It's controlling the heart rhythms. And that's what heart rate variability is, basically the variation in time between each heartbeat. So when the vagus nerve is, is strengthened, right, it's, it's firing really strong, what is happening is that this parasympathetic push is happening. And then as a result, our heart rate variability is increasing. So the lower the heart rate variability, the poorer our vagal tone and the poorer our parasympathetic nervous system is working, right? So then we can expect that if we're sympathetic dominant, then that's a big problem, right? Because then we're pushing those fight or flight stress hormones in our body. And chronically that can cause many disease. So we always want a good heart rate variability. When we are working out, our heartbeat, with our heartbeat raising up, it's the vagal tone that brings the heart rate back down to 60, 80 beats per minute. And a poor vagal tone, like I said, reduce heart rate variability. Now I measure my heart rate variability with an aura ring that I wear. Uh, you can also get it with a whoop bracelet, the heart math device. And there are a bunch of devices that you can get to measure your heart rate variability. So how do we improve our vagal tone non-invasively, right? Without surgery. Well, there's a few ways. The first two, they're new to me, and uh, they're devices. The CerboMed Nemo Stimulator is out of Germany, and it's an external device that you wear like an earphone. And basically what it's doing is it's stimulating the branch of the vagus nerve that goes to the ear with gentle electrical impulses. It's approved in some European countries for uh, treatment of epileptic seizures, but also has been shown in all other studies to stimulate the vagal tone. So pretty interesting device. You just put it on your ear and listen to uh, electric impulses and it'll be stimulating the vagus nerve. The other one, uh, you do a little bit more work. It's called the Gamma Core and it's out of America and it uses electric nerve stimulation. It's a device that uses conductive gel and you with uh, two electrodes and you put it near your uh, carotid the basically you feel for your pulse and there's gentle stimulation of the vagus nerve. So you might feel even your uh, neck muscle contracting, but it's stimulating the vagus nerve. Um, It's actually been shown to reduce inflammatory markers in the blood of healthy people, this device. So it's a really interesting device that that I came across. But what if you don't want to purchase any fancy devices to strengthen your vagal tone? Acupuncture. It seems to be activating the vagus nerve and reducing inflammation and reducing heart rate. One study saw a decrease in tumor necrosis factor alpha. Remember I mentioned that before, the inflammatory protein in the blood uh, in inflamed mice. And it was when the acupuncture point of stomach 36 was stimulated. So you can always go to your acupuncturist and say, hey, do what you got to do, but I need you to prick Uh, stomach 36 also, uh, just for my vagus nerve. They'll probably know how to do it anyway. What else? Hypnosis stimulated the parasympathetic tone of the vagus nerve. Uh, Also, mindful yoga, meditation. Why do I always talk about it? This is a huge part of it. Tai Chi. We saw a randomized controlled trial in the Journal of Psychological Sciences showing positive emotion and social connection. Remember, I talk about community, laughter, all strengthening vagal tone. What about breath work? Yes, deep, deliberate belly breathing called diaphragmatic breathing. That diaphragm is stimulating the vagus nerve uh, as well. So that's strengthening your vagal tone. All of these things you can do, they're cheap, where you can continue to strengthen your vagal tone. Now, remember, a strong vagus nerve is a strong digestion, strong heart rate, uh, strong mood, right? Reduction in inflammation in the body. Remember I said initially the vagus nerve actually 
uh, goes to the back of the throat, back of the throat. So singing, humming, gargling, even gagging is going to activate your vagus nerve. Dr. Datis Karazian's book says, why is it my brain working speaks more on all of these things. So uh, you can even stimulate your vagus nerves when you're brushing your teeth, right? Gargle, or if you're brushing your teeth, um, hit the back of your throat and activating that gag reflex is going to strengthen your vagus nerve. He's actually a big proponent of it. It's really interesting. What else? Cold, 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 cold. Cold exposure is an awesome way to stimulate your vagus nerve. This is why I have an ice bath at home. This is why I take a daily cold shower. It stimulates that vagus nerve and in turn, it is reducing inflammation in the body. While uh, your body's adjusting to the cold stressor, the vagus nerve is firing off and telling your body to relax, creating that parasympathetic tone in your body. Nutritionally, we see actually dietary fat increases these messenger molecules that stimulate the vagus nerve. Um, and the last part, I wanted to just end on some interesting tidbits that I found about vagal tone um, that may be influenced actually by your upbringing or even your parents' health when they were pregnant or your mom's health when she was pregnant. So really uh, interesting stuff. The When it comes to parenting and vagal tone, can you believe there's even a study on this? Parenting and vagal tone. Uh, autonomic parenting was associated with higher resting vagal tone in children, right? Giving children more freedom, more autonomy. Vagal tone plays an important role in the in response to environmental stress, as we talked about in the HPA access. A robust vagal tone means that we respond quickly and flexibly to environmental stress, but also emotional demands. Remember, I told you about the mood part, the depression, the, the anxiety, the anger. Um, a lot of that is going right through the vagus nerve. Uh, and also, it's important for adaptive socio-emotional functioning. In other words, a stronger vagal tone is going to translate to more, uh, it, basically the part that's really important in relationship building. So in essence, really even a strong vagal tone can improve the way you have socio-emotional interactions with partners, uh, coworkers, and whatnot. Now, some studies actually even suggest that vagal tone is passed down from the mother to the child. So mothers who are pregnant, who are depressed, anxious, and angry, can essentially pass down a weaker vagal tone to their newborn. And studies found that adolescents with poor vagal tone uh, have affective, attentional, and behavioral regulation issues uh, that can affect them in school, but also uh, can directly impact their capacity for empathy, which is really incredible to, to think that a, a nerve running from the brain to the abdomen is going to have a have an impact on empathy for adolescents. But yes, adolescents with low attachment styles and high vagal tone were seen to actually have higher empathy. So really there's so much research to be done on the vagus nerve, but essentially to tie it all together, the vagus nerve being a nerve coming out of the brain, it's, it's, it's modulating so much of our health from our heart to, to, to speaking, to breathing, uh, to taste. Uh, but also our digestive system. And it is it is the reason why people say our gut and our brain are connected. It is the roadway between our gut and our brain. And it's bi-directional, remember that. So the gut, if there's an issue, the brain knows, and then it sends back signals back to the gut uh, and vice versa. So what we're seeing is that the vagus nerve can help scan the environment of the gut and make necessary changes, but also it's intimately tied to our stress response. And the big overarching thing is inflammation, right? The cause of many of these mood disorders being pushed by the inflammatory proteins in our body as a result of excess stress. So again, the vagus nerve exerting its anti-inflammatory potential. Guys, it's so simple how to stimulate this vagus nerve. Uh, remember, like this is all cheap stuff and this is why I talk about this, but yeah, if we can optimize our vagus nerve, check on our heart rate variability, get, grab an aura ring, grab a whoop bracelet, grab a heart rate, uh, heart math, uh, device and check your heart rate variability and see if it's improving. You want to see it improve over time because heart rate variability to me is a, a quantitative measure for our overall health. And if that essentially is a measure of overall health, the implication is then that the vagus nerve and our vagal tone is a measure of our overall health as well. Ooh, that was a fun knowledge bomb. I hope you enjoyed that one. Let's get our special guest on. I can't wait to talk to him.
All right, everyone, today's special guest, super special. It's actually our very first and only Nobel Prize winner. Dr. Lou Ignaro is going to talk to us about the amazing research behind nitric oxide and how important it is, even relevant to what's going on now. He's an incredible, incredible mind in this, and I'm looking so forward to this conversation. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. It's great. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was so happy to learn how passionate you are about your sub. The, there's a, a special tie that binds everyone, and it's their passion behind what they want to put out to the world. And you are so passionate about nitric oxide. First of all, for people who are listening, watching, and they've never even heard of nitric oxide, I know what it is, you know what it is. How do we describe it and why it's so beneficial in our health? What does it do? Sure. I'll... Uh... That would take about a week to answer, but I'll do that in a minute or so. But nitric oxide is actually a gaseous substance. You know, it's a gas. It's not a solid. It's not a liquid. It, it, it's a gas. And it's a signaling molecule in the body. It also it exists in the, in the Earth's atmosphere uh, as a toxic gas in the atmosphere. So nobody thought that our bodies would actually produce uh, this nitric oxide. And we discovered that back in the late 1980s, and we showed that the body makes this molecule, which we can call nitric oxide, or we can call NO. But please, let's not confuse it with nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas. That's the gas mm -hmm. you get in the dentist's office, you know, to relieve pain and sort of make you feel a little bit better when you're having your teeth drilled and so on. So this is different. This is nitric oxide. And the major effect, there are many effects in the body, but the first effects that we found when we discovered that the body makes nitric oxide is its um, ability to dilate the blood vessels in order to drop the blood pressure to improve blood flow, and also nitric oxide can prevent inflammation of the arteries, and in so doing, actually prevents stroke and heart attack. So those are just some of the effects of nitric oxide, and I'm sure as we go on, we'll get into more of the effects as well. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating for me when I, when I learned about it in school, about how the body releases it in response to different stimulus. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible the role that it plays for our overall health. But before we even talk about that, how did you get into such a specific molecule? Like what pushed you to nitric oxide? Well, is there, okay. is there anything, what's your story on that part? I'd love to know myself. Yeah, I mean, people, that's one of the most common questions. <laughs> How did I know? Why did I know to go study nitric oxide? And it's real simple. And, you know, you're a doctor, you'll understand. You know, nitroglycerin, besides being the active explosive in Alfred Nobel's dynamite, <laughs> nitroglycerin is a drug that's been used as a vasodilator to treat angina, you know, heart pain for, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, when there's an impending heart attack. So nitroglycerin is a dilator. It dilates the arteries, lowers the blood pressure. That's been known for 100, 120 years. And mm -hmm. so we were the first to work out the mechanism. How does nitroglycerin dilate the arteries. It can't do it by setting off little explosions, you know, it's got to be something else, more pharmacological. And so we studied the metabolism of nitroglycerin, and we found that one of those nitro groups is actually converted to nitric oxide in the arterial smooth muscle. We identified that, and we identified that nitric oxide was the active principle in nitroglycerin. And when we studied the pharmacology of this nitric oxide, we realized, oh my goodness, it's such a potent vasodilator, it inhibits blood clotting, it does all these things. And I said to myself and my people in the lab, I wonder if our bodies can produce this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's where I got the idea, and about 10 years later, we showed that, in fact, our bodies do produce nitric oxide. Mm, amazing, which makes sense why nitroglycerin works for folks yes. who are having, you know, uh, cardiac arrest. So, um, so then you learn about uh, nitric oxide, you found that the body produces it. 
were you at all surprised that you know the mechanism of wh how it produces it is there anything that really grabbed your attention you're like wow this is a very very special molecule well there are a couple of things that grab my attention the first thing is that is the chemistry of nitric oxide nitric oxide is is a gas and before the discovery no one knew of any other gaseous molecules in the body that behave as signaling molecules the other thing was that nitric oxide is very unstable it has a half-life of about three seconds so after a few seconds nitric oxide once it's made is gone it's mm -hmm. it self-destructs it reacts with oxygen and other things and is destroyed and so i couldn't understand or fathom you know why our bodies would make a molecule number one that's a gas and number two that sticks around for a few seconds and then it's destroyed. You had mentioned that nitric oxide is a gas in itself and um, it has a half-life of three seconds. So it's gone pretty fast. Yes. Um, and it, it, is that because it, it's a free radical and it can, if it's around longer, can possibly even cause damage to the body? Or what, what is your theory on that? Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. Uh, because it is a free radical, it can react with other substances in the body that are also free radicals like uh, oxygen radicals, like superoxide, for example. Mm -hmm. And and when the nitric oxide reacts with those other radicals, the nitric oxide gets destroyed. And it took people uh, a while to figure out why uh, the body would want the nitric oxide to be so unstable. And that's real, real simple. When you make, when you generate a signaling molecule, you only want it to be around for a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. If it stayed around longer, it would just keep signaling and signaling and you mm -hmm. wouldn't have any, uh, any kind of uh, rhythm, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of physiologic function. So it's good that it's gone. The, the key thing is that your endothelial cells, for example, in the arteries, they're continuously making nitric oxide. So even though NO is unstable, it, the cells are continually, they're continually making NO. So once mm -hmm. the first NO that's made, you know, is gone, no problem. There's a backup coming right behind it. So there's just continuous production of NO. But when the NO is formed, it can't travel very far, right? Because it's destroyed right away. So that keeps the action of the nitric oxide local rather than producing effects throughout the body so you know mother nature is very very smart mm -hmm. so so for for us folks now who are who want to know all right nitric oxide seems like a pretty good thing for my blood vessels for my heart for blood pressure um a very healthy signaling molecule and uh, it seems like the healthier we are the more robust we have that signaling happening how do we optimize that? What, what, what are some of the things every day that we can start doing to go, all right, you know what, I'm supporting nitric oxide in my body? Well, we can really boil it down to two, two main things, which actually took a few years to figure out, but now it's, it's very sensible. Number one, a healthy, well-balanced diet, and I can go into details about that. That's one thing. And second thing is physical activity. So let me get back to the diet and just focus on one thing, and that is antioxidants. You know, we know that nitric oxide is a free radical. It is unstable. It undergoes oxidation. It undergoes oxidative stress and gets destroyed. But in the presence of antioxidants, then the nitric oxide is stabilized and can last a much longer period of time. And what do I mean by antioxidants? Well, it's, there are so many different kinds of antioxidants in the foods that we eat, in different kinds of fruits, vegetables, and, and so on. Uh, all of these fruits and vegetables contain antioxidants in order to protect themselves against the UV light from the sun. Otherwise, the sun would just kill all the plants, you know, on, on the ground. So the antioxidants actually can prevent that oxidative destruction uh, of themselves, so to speak. Uh, and then we consume 
fruits and vegetables, so we eat all those antioxidants. And one of the major roles of the antioxidants that we ingest is to protect nitric oxide against destruction. That tends to raise the levels of NO and keep them fairly steady. That's why it's a great idea to eat, you know, as, as much fresh fruit and vegetables as mm -hmm. you can. That, that should be part of your diet. Healthy diet. Absolutely, absolutely. This is something that you know that I preach uh, when we even spoke before this. So that's amazing that that uh, the we know the benefit of antioxidants as protecting us from oxidation. But now we know that it can stabilize nitric oxide, stabilize that blood flow, protect our heart. So then, what about nit nitrogen rich foods? Are 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 those foods when you eat them being converted into nitric oxide in the body also? Very good point. Some, some of them are. More mm. specifically, the foods that contain what we, what we call nitrates and nitrites. And nitrate is NO3, nitrite is NO2. When we consume nitrate and nitrate, which are present in foods, those, that can be converted to nitric oxide uh, in the mouth, in the buccal cavity, as well as in the stomach. And so the nitric oxide could find its way into the blood and can be transported to different tissues to serve a, a very useful purpose. And, and the foods that have these nitrites and nitrates are the root vegetables. For example, beets. You know, beets are very popular now. People are making concentrated beet extracts, beetroot juice. I mean, they taste awful, but <laughs> they do, they do have, uh, they can produce nitric oxide in the body. But you know, we can get back to spinach. Spinach has lots of nitrite and nitrate. And over a hundred years ago, Popeye knew that. I mean, mm -hmm. he ate spinach to give him strength. And you know, nobody knew why uh, the manufacturers you know, the producers, uh, the farmers of spinach said it had a high iron content and that's why it was good to eat. And they were correct, it does. But I think the better answer is it contains, spinach contains nitrite and nitrates, which can be converted to nitric oxide in the body. And that can have all kinds of benefits when you're working out, for example. And also just staying healthy, cardiovascular health. Mm. So, so maybe even as a pre-workout, a lot of us can really start maybe making about an hour, an hour and a half before, maybe um, some beet juice or some spinach, blend it up, uh, maybe some other nitrite or nitrogen-rich foods. Yes, that's one way. That's one way. There, there are other ways, too, which were actually uh, developed maybe 15 years prior to this more recent development uh, with eating foods. Uh, one of the things I got into, uh, and then this was followed by many, many, many different companies, is that if you eat um, certain amino acids, now protein is made up of about, about 20 amino acids. Each amino acid has a specific function in the body. Well, there are two amino acids, one in particular in protein, uh, that stimulates nitric oxide production, and that amino acid is called arginine. Arginine is an amino acid that your body needs to make nitric oxide. And without getting into detail, nitric oxide is produced in the body from, by an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase very appropriately named, NO synthase. And this enzyme uses arginine as the substrate. In other words, the arginine amino acid binds to the enzyme and the enzyme rapidly makes nitric oxide. The enzyme takes NO from one of the amino groups on arginine, just in case anybody's interested, converts it to NO and you have nitric oxide. So if you eat healthy protein, which will be digested to arginine, that'll boost NO. 
but also now amino acids, you can buy them. They're a dime a dozen. You can buy them from manufacturers. These are naturally occurring amino acids, one of them being arginine. And so there are many supplements out in the market now, at least 25, which contain arginine. And if you consume those, then for sure, your endothelial cells will make lots of nitric oxide, which is very healthy for the endothelial cells. So, you know, we're, we're lucky. We have various ways we can produce more nitric oxide. I love that because so then essentially you're eating these foods and before a workout, you're stimulating nitric oxide. So you are bringing more blood flow to the muscle, hence having better athletic performance, right? That's exactly right. That's why, uh, you know, people who are athletes or people like me who think they're athletes and <laughs> want to work out and and stay and stay healthy. You know, we do whatever we can to boost that nitric oxide. So um, I I uh, I liked I personally like to take the, the capsules or powders that contain lots of arginine. Mm -hmm. Citrulline is another amino acid that's mm -hmm. readily converted to nitric oxide, and that's becoming more popular. Uh, I used to run marathons, but you know, being 79 years old, I can't run marathons anymore. So I do a lot of bicycling, but road biking up in the hills where I live here in, in Southern California. And in the water bottles uh, that I have on the bike, I've got them loaded up with uh, arginine containing solutions and uh, also antioxidants like vitamin C. Ascorbic mm. acid is a great uh, antioxidant, it's very cheap. And so if you mix your antioxidants with your arginine, you know, you, I think that you get a good boost of uh, NO. That's been demonstrated um, in laboratory animals. It's also been demonstrated in humans. But as you know, it's very difficult to do clinical trials on food additives and so on. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have any clinical trials that it works. But the science is there. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a scientist. If I believe in the science, I'll do it. You, you know, you have me thinking about the ultimate pre-workout smoothie now with some root yeah, right. vegetables, <laughs> some spinach, some citrulline-rich foods, arginine-rich foods, some antioxidants. I mean, you'll be loaded up before a workout or an athletic uh, performance. You know, really, it's almost as if you entered my kitchen in the mornings to see what my wife and I do. My wife, Sharon, is a physician, anesthesiologist, and she's into being healthy and working out. She's a great cyclist. So what do we do every morning? Let me tell you, we, we get a healthy protein powder, you know, very healthy. It's got lots of arginine and so on mm -hmm. in there. So we, we make a shake, but to that, we add a boost of arginine and we add strawberries and blueberries f lots of antioxidants right mm -hmm. and so we make a gamish of that we just blend that with a little bit of ice cubes we have it every single morning and when we're biking we have it about a half hour before we get on our bikes so we're thinking along the same lines that's a great I love way that. to go yeah, is it so? Is that about the time you need before an athletic performance? Say you're drinking, uh, uh, you're making a drink with all of these rich nitric oxide uh, promoting foods. Is it like half an hour, an hour? What, what is a good time stamp? You think? I, I think on an empty stomach or partially empty stomach. I'm, I based on a lot of different work that's been done. I would say thirty to forty minutes is uh, is a good one. 30 right. to 40 minutes would be good. And as I said, I carry these drinks on my bike so that continuously, you know, when I'm, you have to drink water when you're riding 50, 60 mm -hmm. miles and climbing 3,000 feet. And so I have all that in the water. And so I'm constantly drinking that. Okay, so Lou, really the, the, the last part of this that I wanted to touch on was you mentioned about nitric oxide and the coronavirus or the state of what we're going through now. And there's some intriguing stuff that you found. Um, maybe we can talk about that? Sure, I, I'd love to. The, uh, the coronavirus is obviously a very deadly um, disease, infection. And the biggest problem now, if you look at the patients who died from the COVID-19, uh, that coronavirus, of course, gets into the lungs and attaches to certain 
tissues in the lungs. And the first thing it does is it destroys the endothelial cell layer in the lungs. It causes inflammation of the endothelium and destroys the endothelium. Now, remember, the endothelial cells are the only cells in blood vessels that make nitric oxide. So what happens when you destroy or remove the nitric oxide? What happens is that you don't get vasodilation anymore, so you get vasoconstriction in the lungs, so blood is not coming into the lungs to get oxygen. Also, nitric oxide not only relaxes arteries, but it also relaxes the airways, the trachea, the bronchioles, and so nitric oxide dilates them so that more air and therefore more oxygen can get into uh, the lungs. The third thing that our natural nitric oxide does, it, it acts as an antimicrobial agent. In other words, nitric oxide is well known to react with and kill bacteria, parasites, and viruses. So those are the three main things that nitric oxide does. We're breathing nitric oxide if we inhale through our nose. The, the nose can produce lots of nitric oxide. That's been measured. The mouth does not produce any nitric oxide. So it's very advantageous to breathe in through your nose whenever you can, because mm -hmm. when you do that, you will take the nitric oxide being made in the nasal mucosa and bring them into the lungs. And so that nitric oxide will bring in more air, therefore more oxygen. That nitric oxide will dilate the pulmonary arteries to bring in more blood to take up the more oxygen that's coming in. And so you can really saturate the blood with oxygen. So it's always good to breathe in through your nose, especially now during the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe breathing in through the nose could be one preventive way. In other words, a way to prevent getting early signs of COVID-19. Uh, just because you're constantly delivering the nitric oxide into the lungs. We know the nose makes enormous amounts of NO. And so why not take advantage of this knowledge during this time and breathe in through your nose to try to perhaps uh, fight that coronavirus infection. We have nothing well, to lose by doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's safe and, and interesting, right? We know the mechanism. Why wait for any scientific studies to show that, um, it, right? Is this is what you're saying? Like we know what it does. Why not just yes. practice that uh, nose breathing? Not only that, but right now, as we speak, there are five big clinical trials going on Inhaled nitric oxide, low amounts, are being given to patients with severe COVID-19. Five different clinical trials, several hundred patients, and the results are not out yet. But, you know, I know some of the people doing these studies, and they tell me that the nitric oxide inhalation is working extremely well. So wow. when I saw that, I just, I, I was going to tape my mouth shut so that I could keep breathing in through my nose. I was just going to say that because I do practice mouth taping before I go to bed every night because... Oh, um, oh, that's great. Yeah, we had a dentist in on here, actually, a biological dentist, talk about nitric oxide through the nose, through respiration, and the importance of nasal breathing when you're in bed throughout the night going ah. to sleep. So oh, it's pretty fantastic. incredible. That's great. Yeah. See, I didn't make it up then. You heard it from someone else as well. I, that's exactly. very good. So I love that. So, <laughs> so, so to reiterate, we just literally just stopping and maybe getting awareness to how we're breathing. If we're breathing through our mouth or if we are, stop and start doing some nasal breathing to increase that nitric oxide, which is essentially going to protect our lungs as an antimicrobial against other infections, which is pretty incredible stuff. All right, Louis Ignaro, what a wonderful guest. I feel so honored to have a Nobel Prize winner on this show uh, amongst everyone else who's ever came on. But thank you for taking the time, rating, reviewing, subscribing, supporting the show. I love you all truly, great, gratefully. A lot of love coming from my heart to each and every one of you. Thank you for taking the time and spreading this show to everyone you care about. I'll see you next week.